class. This is Dr. Anderson, and we are starting reproductive physiology, and we're going to start with male reproductive physiology. So here are our learning objectives. Uh, we want to describe the role of the Y chromosome in maleness. So there's a special gene on the Y chromosome that codes for actions that then determine the male phenotype. Next, we want to describe the structures that form and transport sperm. We want to describe the feedback regulation of testosterone from puberty to maturity. Um, we also want to predict changes in that feedback if, say, you add testosterone to the system or testosterone is lost from the system. And finally, we want to talk about the, the functions of testosterone. All right. So sex is genetically determined. If an embryo receives an X and an X, that's the genotype, and the phenotype then is femaleness. If um, an embryo is genotypically XY, then phenotypically they are male. And in embryonic development, the reproductive system starts out undifferentiated or androgynous. There are two sets of tubing. There are male tubing and female tubing. There's a set of gonads, but early in embryonic development, you don't know if this organism is going to be a male or female. But early in embryonic development, there is an expression of the SRY gene on the Y chromosome. And when that gene is expressed, what happens is the testes are stimulated to produce testosterone that testosterone then differentiates the male structures. They're called Wolfarian tubules. There's also the production of a, of a substance called anti-Mullerian hormone, and that causes the degeneration of the female tubes. So when the SRY gene is expressed, the embryo differentiates into a male. In the absence of the SRY gene expression, then the embryo differentiates into a female. So the primary reproductive organ in males are the testes, and they have two main jobs. They produce sperm, and they produce testosterone. Now the testes are suspended actually outside the abdominal cavity in a sac called the scrotum, and they have an interesting blood supply. There's a artery, a testicular artery, and a testicular vein, and um, essentially what happens is that you have warm blood traveling from the ab abdominal cavity to the testes. I can get my uh, um, pointer to work here. And then you have cooler venous blood then going towards the abdominal cavity. And essentially what happens is the warm blood from the, in the artery is flowing right past the cooler blood in the vein. And heat will transfer over from the, there we go, from the artery to the vein. So heat is then saved in the abdominal cavity if I can get my finger to do this. Heat is then saved in the abdominal cavity, and then the testes are then cooler. Now, who cares about that? Well, sperm production happens more successfully at a temperature that's, say, three to four degrees cooler than abdominal temperature. All righty. So you see here the testes, here are the testes inside the scrotum, and uh, so the scrotum keeps the testes a little bit cooler. That promotes sperm production, and those testes produce sperm and secrete hormones, and a major hormone secreted by the testes is testosterone. All righty, so if we look inside the testes here, so you see the, this big structure here. Do you see all these tubules? Let me get my laser pointer back. 
all of these tubules, tubules and tubules and tubules. Those are called the seminiferous tubules. They contain um, spermatogenic cells. So there are stem cells called spermatogonia. And then there are support cells called Sertoli cells. So the spermatogenic cells undergo spermatogenesis and end up becoming sperm. But the Sertoli cells surround and protect the developing sperm. In addition, there are some Leydig cells. And the Leydig cells are the cells producing testosterone. So here is a light microscope drawing. Here's the seminiferous tubule. All right, I'm, I'm circling around the wall. Then there's a basement membrane that protects the seminiferous tubules. There are stem cells that undergo mitosis. And then as they differentiate through meiosis, they migrate towards the lumen. And so you can see some sperm in this lumen here. And then in between the seminiferous tubules, there are collections of cells called Leydig cells, and those produce testosterone. So the cells that undergo mitosis, the stem cells, are called, called spermatogonia. They tend to be at the basal level. Then they differentiate into primary spermatocytes. They're going to divide and become secondary spermatocytes. Then they're going to divide again and become a spermatid. And then they're going to differentiate and become a sperm or a spermatozoa. So the Sertoli cells surround all the cells in various stages of spermatogenesis. They provide the developing gametes with nutrients. So all substances have to go through the Sertoli cells in order to get to the sperm cells. And so they form a layer of protection around the developing sperm, and that's called the blood testis barrier. Sertoli cells secrete proteins themselves. Inhibin is a peptide sort of regulatory substance. Um, we could call it a hormone. We could also call it a paracrine agent. Activin. And then androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein binds testosterone, not to carry it in the blood but to hold testosterone in place so that high levels of testosterone will stay in the testes. All right, so many of you have had general biology. You've talked about mitosis and meiosis, but maybe in a general way. So let's review that before we go on to spermatogenesis. So up here we have a cell. The chromosomes are condensed and they're replicated. If those chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate and we just separate the sister chromatids, then you've got two cells that look exactly like the parent cells. That's a process called mitosis. One division, I'm sorry, one replication, one division, two identical cells result from the division process. Meiosis is much more complicated. So here we have some chromosomes that have condensed, and they line up on the metaphase plate, but not in single file. They line up in homologous pairs. And so you have a homologous pair of sister chromatids, and those are called tetrads. Then the tetrads exchange DNA. That's a process called crossing over. And notice that the tetrads sort independently. Let's say the red chromosomes came from mom and the blue chromosomes came from dad. Notice the, not all dad's chromosomes go in one cell and not all mom's chromosomes go in the other. And I'm talking about the chromosomes that you have that you got from your parents. They line up any old way. That's called independent assortment. So between crossing over and independent assortment, that means the gametes are going to be unique. I hope that sounds familiar from your general biology course. So these cells line up in homologous pairs on the metaphase plate. One chromosome goes to one cell, the other chromosome goes to the other cell. So now we have two cells that are produced from meiosis one, and now these cells are haploid. Each chromosome is duplicated, but they're no longer paired. So these haploid cells undergo another division. They line up single file on the metaphase plate. The sister chromatids are divided, and now we have four cells. Four cells that are haploid 
and all genetically unique. And that is the point of putting the, en the energy into sexual reproduction as opposed to fission or, or asexual reproduction, is that you mix up the chromosomes and you get offspring that are all genetically diverse. So you're hoping that, some, that all of your offspring have unique characteristics that will enable them to survive uh, no matter what happens. Okay, so let's take that and apply it to spermatogenesis. So we have stem cells that are called sper spermatogonia, or spermatogonium in the singular. Some remain as stem cells, but others progress into to meiosis. They differentiate and they become a primary spermatocyte. The DNA, DNA replicates, the chromosomes condense, homologous pairs line up into tetrads, they perform the crossing over, they support, they uh, assort independently, then there's a division, and now you have two secondary spermatocytes. They are haploid, but each chromosome is duplicated. So then we have a second division, and now we have four spermatids that then can differentiate in spermatozoa. These are all haploid cells, and they're all genetically unique. One primary spermatocyte ends up being four sperm. So sperm are very, very specialized cells. They're basically DNA delivery devices. So in the midpiece here, there are a lot of mitochondria. The mitochondria kind of loop around the midpiece. They are producing ATP because there are all these microtubules in the flagella or tail that have to slide once against one another so the tail can whip and the sperm can swim. Here's that haploid nucleus, and then it's covered by an acrosome. The acrosome is filled with enzymes that allow the sperm to penetrate the cells around the oocyte so there can be a fertilization. Now, sperm require a fluid to be transported in. That, that fluid is called semen. And there are three sets of glands that result in the production of semen. There are the seminal vesicles. So right here, there are the prostate gland and the Cowper's gland. So please notice, we have testes. That's where the sperm are produced. Here's a little cap called the epididymis. Some of the sperm are stored there. Then we have a vas deferens that carry the sperm. Now notice, it loops around the back of the bladder. And then at that point, the secretions from the seminal vesicle join. And now that tube is called an ejaculatory duct. It receives secretions from the prostate gland, and now this tube is called the urethra, and then there are glands from the bulbo-urethra glands. These are also called Cowper's glands. So all three of these glands contribute this fluid, and then the sperm plus the fluid, the semen, can be ejaculated from the reproductive organ or the copulatory organ, the penis. So semen is a fluid for sperm transport. It's a secretion from seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, the bulbo-urethra glands. And sperm contains very important substances. First of all, it contains bicarbonate. What we're going to find is the female reproductive tract is quite acidic. And the bicarbonate helps neutralize that acid and protects the sperm. There are energy substrates like citrate and fructose. That enables the sperm to have organic molecules to make ATP out of. And then there are some motility factors. Some of those motility factors, for example, are prostaglandins. And that's going to encourage the sperm to be swimming cells. So the sperm aren't really able to swim until they meet the semen and those motility factors and the energy substrates. All right. So we've talked about the development of sperm. Let's talk about the development of hormones. So here's the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to produce a releasing hormone called 
GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, that's going to travel through the portal system down to the anterior pituitary where it meets cells called gonadotrophs and those cells produce two hormones. One cell produces two hormones. One cell is called FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. The other hormone is called LH, and that stands for luteinizing hormone. And they have separate jobs. FSH goes to the Sertoli cells, binds to receptors on the Sertoli cells, and causes the production of growth factors that are going to encourage development of the sperm. So the Sertoli cells are going to make peptides that regulate um, spermatogenesis and androgen binding protein that's going to bind onto to, um, testosterone already. Now, the other hormone produced from the gonadotrophs is LH, luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone goes to the Leydig cells. When it binds to the Leydig cells, it encourages those Leydig cells to secrete testosterone. Testosterone then can work on spermatogenesis. Testosterone then is converted to a more powerful form of testosterone, um, dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And uh, an so androgen receptors are going to be found um, in the Sertoli cells. Androgen receptors are then found all over the body. So testosterone is going to go out and carry out the actions. Um, so before birth, testosterone is important for developing the embryo into a male. At puberty, testosterone is important for developing the male sex organs, developing male secondary characteristics, uh, getting taller, broad shoulders, a deeper voice, growing a beard, all those sorts of things. Testosterone is a very powerful anabolistic um, or anabolic hormone. It promotes protein synthesis and growth. Now, if testosterone levels are too high, then they're going to feed back and inhibit LH from the uh, anterior pituitary and feed back and inhibit GnRH from the hypothalamus. When sperm production is adequate, the Sertoli cells produce a substance called inhibin. Inhibin then feeds back and inhibits FSH. So I need you to understand that there are basically two separate negative feedback mechanisms. The one is GnRH to LH to testosterone, and testosterone then is regulated by negative feedback. The other one is FSH to the Sertoli cells to the production of sperm. Adequate sperm production is signaled by inhibin. Inhibin then feeds back to inhibit FSH. How in the world are you going to remember this? Well, here's how I do it. Get my pen here. One thing you can do is follow the L's. So LH goes to the Leydig cells, and then we get male androgen, which is testosterone. We also can follow the S's. FSH goes to the Sertoli cells, and then we get growth factors for spermatogenesis. Now, Testosterone is also needed for spermatogenesis. And not everybody agrees on this, but one way this is described is that FSH and testosterone work together to make sperm, and that effect is synergistic. Um, I have a problem with that because FSH and testosterone don't make sperm on their own. They have to be together. So it's, it seems more like a permissive effect to me, but guess what? If, not the, if no one agrees on what this is, then that wouldn't be a fair test question, would it? Of course not. But I would like you to appreciate that both FSH and testosterone are needed for sperm production. 
Now, what else does what does sperm, this testosterone do in addition to spermatogenesis? Well, negative feedback regulation. And I'm going to get my little Tinkerbell back. So negative feedback regulation of the hypothalamus and LH. Testosterone helps develop the male organs, secondary male characteristics. Testosterone is important for the sex drive and important in both males and females. Females have a little bit of testosterone. Growth and sealing of the epiphyseal plate. I hope you remember that when we were talking about growth hormone. So testosterone helps that growth spurt and finally the sealing of the epiphyseal plate in addition to other hormones. It increases hematocrit. That's why, remember, Frank has more, um, test, has more uh, hemoglobin than Mary because Frank has testosterone. That's the stronger stimulator of erythropoietin. And it's important for anabolism and increased muscle mass. All right, critical thinking exercise. Men with decreased anterior pituitary gland function can have decreased sperm production as well as low testosterone. Now, have you seen all those commercials? You're not getting older. It's just low T. So take this underarm gel and apply that testosterone and get back to the dance floor. Well, okay, let's think about that. A man takes testosterone that would correct his testosterone levels, would then that re restore sperm production to normal? Well, no, because testosterone alone can't do it. We also need FSH. So we'd want to find out why the anterior pituitary was depressed, and testosterone alone would not help the man's fertility. It would help him maybe feel better and be able to um, be sexually active, but would not necessarily restore sperm production to normal. All right, what happens with pu puberty? Well, when we are children, our hypothalamus is very, very sensitive to um, negative feedback by testosterone. Just a small amount of testosterone inhibits the hypothalamus and shuts it down. But with puberty, the sensitivity of the hypothalamus changes such that it's less sensitive. And all of a sudden, that very tiny amount of testosterone no longer inhibits the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus says, well, where the heck is my sex hormone? I can't sense it. So the hypothalamus starts to produce its releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then goes to the portal system. The portal system causes the production of LH. LH then goes to the testes and stimulates the production of testosterone. Testosterone then works on the, on the body, starts to develop the male organs. And the first sign of puberty in boys is growth of the testicles. So the testicles start to grow, the, the scrotum starts to get loose and wrinkly, the penis grows. Later on, then there is pubic hair. Testosterone then accelerates growth. The growth spurt happens much later in puberty than growth of the, of the testicles and even the development, the, the ability to be able to produce sperm. So I don't know if you remember, and I think it's in fifth grade. I'm not quite sure that I remember. It's been a long time. But I think in fifth grade, there's a period of time when the girls are taller than the boys. The girls go through puberty first they have their growth spurt earlier. They end up being taller than the boys. And then later on, the boys really take off and they have a big growth spurt. And then so then in high school, the boys are taller than the girls in general. Um, and of course, then when that epiphyseal plate seals and comes completely calcified, then that man has reached his adult height. So uh, I'm going to end the presentation here. If you're watching this at home, this would be a great time to get out your critical thinking book and start working on exercise 9.1. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time to do that in class and, um, and start thinking about those negative feedback mechanisms 
And what happens if testosterone is added to the system or testosterone is taken away from the system and how that changes the feedback. So thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you in class.